kind of the same type of uh, the same type of physics, but in uh, kind of somewhat different contexts. Um, so in today's talk, I'm going to talk about Moiré header structures, and um, in the second talk, I'm going to talk about how to realize the same type of physics uh, without a Moiré, and you know what the salient similarities and differences um, might be between those two. So let me start in a really basic, uh, from a really basic fact that uh, you know ferromagnetism is really the basis of everything I'm going to talk about. I think that's in many ways the most important feature of all of the experimental systems that I'll uh, discuss and that from which all of the rest of the many body physics uh, effectively um, flows. And ferromagnetism has a very old history. Uh, ferromagnets were, you know, some of the, you know, were noticed already in, in deep antiquity um, in the, you know, fifth and sixth centuries uh, BC. Uh, it's said that Thales, uh, who didn't, none of his writings survived, but some of his, uh, his uh, descendants um, recorded that he noted the attraction of iron uh, oxide um, or, you know, lodestone to metal and concluded from that that matter is alive. So um, theory of magnetism has uh, improved since then a fair amount, um, in particular, uh, the Born von Leeuwen theorem tells you that uh, classically, um, the free energy is independent of the vector potential. So uh, magnetism is zero classically. There's no classical magnetism. It's a quantum mechanical effect. But from another point of view, um, experiments on magnetism have not progressed that much because almost all magnets that we know uh, are based on the same basic physics uh, as that observed by Thales, which is the alignment of electron uh, spins um, due, to, due to exchange. So um, the way this works, again, to just review basic quantum mechanics is the problem from Landau Lifshitz, um, is that when you have repulsive Coulomb interactions and Fermi statistics, that's basically the, those are the two necessary ingredients for magnetism. So you can do the problem of considering two electrons in uh, finite square wells and uh, calculate the energy splitting between um, symmetric and anti-symmetric combinations of the ground state wave functions for those two electrons in the two different square wells. And there's uh, generally speaking, when you calculate those Coulomb uh, matrix elements, there's uh, a, a splitting between the symmetric and anti-symmetric uh, uh, two-particle wave functions. And when um, that uh, symmet anti-symmetric state is, is favored, then uh, that favors a symmetric spin state because the total wave function has to be uh, anti-symmetric, hence the, that's the Fermi uh, statistics. And so that's, uh, that's the origin of ferromagnet. And of course, there's a little more subtlety, right? In three dimensions, you get an ordered state uh, below some temperature. Uh, in two dimensions, you need some anisotropy to get uh, ordering. That's usually in, in um, most uh, magnetic materials provided by um, spin orbit coupling, uh, which distinguishes a direction for those spins uh, to align and couples them to the, to the lattice, let's say. Um, in solids, you also have to worry about, you know, in a, in a system where the localization of those electrons is not perfect, you have to worry about hopping. And so that's captured basically by the stoner criterion. So you can think about um, a band uh, of electrons has a certain bandwidth gamma and ferromagnetism costs you some kinetic energy because if you're going to polarize, if you're gonna make a ground state that has, uh, let's say only spin up occupied, then of course that's gonna cost you uh, kinetic energy because you can only singly occupy these band states um, and so, generally speaking, ferromagnetism happens when, uh, you know, crudely, when this so-called stoner criterion is met. In other words, when the energy you gain from exchange exceeds the energy you lose uh, from the bandwidth. So uh, the crude requirement is that you want to make density of states large or exchange uh, large. Either of those two things or both of them um, work well. But typically, uh, when we start off from... Uh, band theory, uh, the thing that you can tune around is, is density of states. Okay, so from this point of view, you know, graphene-based systems are, of course, very unlikely uh, forums uh, to study magnetism because they're very two-dimensional, which is already bad for, for ordering. Uh, their orbitals are very delocalized. Their density of states is correspondingly low, and there's no spin-orbit coupling. So you essentially have none of the um, ingredients that you usually have for magnetism. So you have to do something uh, to graphene to make this uh, uh, to, to turn this into a magnet. And so the talk, what I'm going to talk about in these uh, talks is mostly, although not exclusively, um, about 
uh, using valleys uh, in graphene to, um, uh, to uh, as, as your basic degree of freedom for magnetism. And I'll talk about how this, uh, how this works out. But, but to review for those of you who are, are not, you know, working in this field, and, you know, I mean, I think almost everybody has done this as a textbook problem at this point. Um, if you just take monolayer graphene and you uh, solve a sim the simplest possible tight binding model, you find that uh, the low energy electrons, meaning the electrons at uh, new, you know, charge neutrality uh, for this lattice uh, are uh, clustered in momentum space around the corners of the Brillouin zone. And there are two inequivalent corners, which are called the K points. They look like valleys, so they're called valleys. And at low energies, these valleys essentially constitute an internal degree of freedom for the electrons, which you can say is distinguished uh, on the lattice scale. It's an internal degree of freedom the same way that spin is an internal degree of freedom. Of course, spins are presumably distinguished on the Planck scale, which you definitely don't access uh, in a condensed matter experiment. Um, the valleys are distinguished on the lattice scale, but that's nevertheless a well-separated length scale from, let's say, the Fermi wavelength uh, that's typical in, um, in experiments done on graphene, where you're doping uh, these Dirac points using electrostatic gates to within, let's say, a few uh, times 10 to the 12 uh, electrons per square centimeter um, away from that charge neutrality point, which corresponds to Fermi wavelengths of nanometers or, or tens of nanometers um, uh, are, are typical. Uh, really more tens of tens of nanometers or more. So there's a good separation of scales and valley is an internal degree of freedom. Of course, unlike spin, the valley degree of freedom, you know, it does correspond to, uh, you know, in some sense, a real space orbit in the plane. It's an orbital uh, you know, as we'll see, it's, it's got an orbital magnetic moment attached to it, which is highly anisotropic. And that's going to be kind of essential to, um, to the fact that these can be indeed, you know, uh, spontaneously orbit. So um, orbital magnetism, of course, is like a generic feature in, in solids, or an orbital magnetic moment is a generic feature in solids. So, uh, you know, this so-called modern theory of, um, you know, very curvature in solids, uh, you can calculate the um, the orbital magnetization, and it depends, you know, and, and that's essentially by projecting the angular momentum operator into the space of block states. And you find that there's uh, there are two sort of distinguishable contributions, or I mean, at least it's it's nicely written in terms of two contributions. Uh, one of which you can think about as the self rotation of the wave packet, and the other is the center of mass motion uh, of of a, of, a, of, a, of a wave packet. And um, of course, you this is uh, sum over you know block states and any. Uh, solid will generally have some orbital contribution to the magnetization. Um, what I'm going to tell you about today is really a situation in graphene where that is the dominant contribution, and that is what drives the physics, whereas it's much more common in, um, in most ferromagnets, for example, for this to be a uh, secondary contribution to, let's say, the spins, uh, the spins in, in a um, in a given material, which which are forming the bulk of the of the magnetically or of the ordered moments, um, and it's uh, so so there are some you know there are some exceptions uh, to that. For example, in these samarium aluminum compounds, there was this report already twenty years ago, and I, I don't actually know the follow up literature to this very well, but um, of a ferromagnet having no net magnetic moment, which was uh, interpreted as saying, okay, in these in these materials, uh, the orbital contributions, in other words, this formula here is equal and rough, roughly equal and opposite to within their experimental resolution to the, um, to the spin magnetic moment. So it is indeed breaking time reversal symmetry, but you have, let's say, a spin moment in one direction and an orbital moment in the other direction. Um, but this arises very naturally in graphene systems, as was pointed out by uh, Di Xiao and Chan Nu, um, uh, you know, very shortly after the, the experimental discovery of graphene. Uh, and it, it arises naturally because when you gap a Dirac point, let's say, in graphene, you would do it by uh, putting a staggered uh, potential on the A and B sublattices that would gap out these Dirac points. Then uh, you um, you generate a lot of very curvature at those gap Dirac points, and that very curvature generates an orbital moment. Now, a key point, right, which uh, which I'll come back to, is that you know, of course, this orbital magnetization is going to vanish in the presence of time reversal symmetry, uh, but in, and in graphene, that manifests by the fact that the orbital magnetization is going to be uh, 
equal and opposite in the two valleys, but it can be very large in an individual valley, unlike, say, a system where electrons are near the gamma point, where it kind of has to vanish at the gamma point. But at the k and k prime points, it can be large. It just has to be equal and opposite uh, in the two valleys. So a general feature of these graphene systems is that they can have large orbital moments, which will be equal and opposite in the two valleys. And that'll turn out to be true for a number of other quantities, including, for example, the Berry curvature itself, and therefore the churn number, let's say, if you have bands uh, in the two different valleys. OK, so, so the basic outline, I mean, today I'm going to try to cover a fair amount of ground, and I'm going to try to talk about a little bit older work on uh, moiré systems. So these are systems where you use uh, the interplay of lattices either rotationally misaligned or with lattice mismatches between two van der Waals layers to make, uh, uh, to make a super lattice. And the super lattice has a wavelength such that you can actually, using uh, electrostatic gates, uh, control the filling from zero filling to full filling of the band and anything in between. And these essentially are like a model system for, um, you know, for, for studying electrons and lattices. Uh, and um, in particular, for exploring these, uh, these types of effects, what they really give you, and I'll come back to this actually also in the second talk, is uh, the possibility of having gap states at finite density that's not too high. That's something that you can actually uh, control uh, with a gate. And um, I'll try to walk through sort of a variety of uh, phenomenology that we've discovered in these systems or, or you know, uh, have been seen by other groups, including maybe most spectacularly quantum anomalous Hall effects uh, in a variety of these systems where the interplay of these orbital moments and uh, um, the finite churn number of the super lattice bands uh, that come from this moiré, from this moiré potential uh, can allow you to just spontaneously form a quantum anomalous Hall effect of a variety of different, uh, uh, of different types. Um, so uh, there's some phenomenology I'll talk about there. I'll talk about uh, um, magnetic imaging of these and you know, how disorder is important uh, in these types of systems. And then also a bit how um, the dynamics of these uh, magnetic moments, um, both of the orbital variety and of, of, of uh, arising from spin, um, may have something to do with, let's say, the superconductivity, or at least certainly the finite temperature transport. And then in the second talk, I'm going to try to revisit a lot of this physics, but in a system without a moiré, which is a rhombohedral trilayer graphene, and shares some really recent work, um, where it turns out, even without a moiré potential, you can get the same type of magnetism, and indeed also superconductivity right at the cusp of a variety of ferromagnetic transitions um, without, uh, without any moiré potential, but just exploiting uh, kind of natural uh, Van Hove singularity. But anyway, that's, 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 that's for another day, I guess tomorrow or the day after. Um, the talk for today is really going to focus on, uh, on moiré systems. Okay, so just before I get to the physics, let me just give you a little bit of background on, um, on how these samples are made, right? So um, in all of these systems that I'm going to tell you about, you know, one starts with uh, substrate, which has exfoliated two-dimensional material, whatever that is. So let's say you have a silicon substrate, and on top of it, you have a slice of gra a flake of graphene or a flake of hexagonal boron nitride or any number of other two-dimensional materials. And then the way that these header structures all are built is that you can bring a polymer stamp into contact with that and then pop it off so that it's now adhered to the to the polymer stamp. And so this you know process uh, schematically in the microscope. Oh, sorry. Is my audio uh, still good? Yeah, still good. Yeah. Okay. Good. 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 Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, right. um, uh, you can see this is a flake of boron nitride. You, uh, let me make sure I have my pointer. Um, uh, a flake of boron nitride, and this polymer stamp is withdrawing and popping that. But well, should pop it off the substrate at the end. I'm not sure that the. There it goes. Goodbye. OK, and so you can use that to build up. And then you can repeat that process using, uh, let's say, your boron nitride flake to then pick up a graphene, and then that to pick up a boron nitride. So you can build up some very complex uh, stacks uh, of, of graphene and, uh, and boron nitride and any other 2D material. The graphene and boron nitride are exclusively what I'm going to tell you about today. And there have been a number of sort of important um, uh, you know, milestones in this path. Uh, to making these systems, not just that you can make these systems, but that you can actually make them extremely clean. So, um, you know, in the early days of graphene, people put graphene on silicon oxide substrates, which are amorphous and rough. Um, 
that was partially fixed by suspending layers of graphene uh, so that they were away from any substrate. And you certainly saw that the graphene itself is essentially free of defects. Um, you know, an improvement that, that, that we made when I was a PhD student was to encapsulate, you know, start to put graphene on hexagonal boron nitride substrates, which are single crystals. They're very clean. They're very flat. Uh, and, uh, and so that helps you remove these ripples and corrugations. It also helps you remove charged impurities. Eventually, uh, it was understood that you could encapsulate on both sides, and that made a difference because then you'd remove adsorbates that might be stuck to the graphene and provide scattering centers for the electrons. And then the, the breakthrough that for us has been very important lately is, um, is really getting rid of not just adsorbates directly on the graphene, but any insulator to vacuum interface seems to be a magnet for adsorbates. But you know, the, the basic insight is that um, hexagonal boron nitride graphite interfaces are very clean and they're self-cleaning in the sense that if you have, let's say, polymer residues or other things, if you heat it up, these, these materials want to stick together. They want to make a very flat and clean and pristine interface. And so there's some irreversible dynamics where these impurities will be pushed out to the edges of the device, and then they won't get back in. So um, if you make all van der Waals stacks, as I'm, as I'm drawing here, so graphite, hexagonal boron nitride, bilayer graphene, for example, and then another hexagonal boron nitride and graphite, and the graphite here is used as an electrostatic gate, then from the point of view of the sample of interest, which in this case, let's say bilayer graphene, uh, there's no non-clean interface that it sees. It just sees perfectly uniform charge distributions um, in the graphite because it's seeing a single facet of a uh, of a crystal in this case some some you know mesoscopically thick uh, graphite crystal that turns out to be a huge improvement even over using let's say regular metal where something called the patch effect ends up limiting your mobility and your charge uniformity because when you deposit a metal in the clean room you um, it's polycrystalline and those polycrystalline grains. Um, uh, uh, have different work functions, and that turns out to be a big effect for the low electron densities that uh, uh, that we're interested in, and the subtle sort of many body physics we're typically interested in. So, just to give some idea, right? You can make, you can assemble these types of structures, and by studying Landau level broadening, which is a, a you know something that that characterizes that disorder, you find that in these types of uh, it, in samples made in this way, you typically have Landau level broadening on the order of five to ten Kelvin, and you can compare this to the best. Uh, three, five semiconductor, you know, gallium arsenide quantum wells, where it's maybe two Kelvin. So we're sort of, you know, a factor of a few, uh, maybe a maybe an order of magnitude, but 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 it's sort of less than an order of magnitude worse than the best gallium arsenide. Um, but uh, uh, but uh, you know, as you'll see, there's sort of a, a different uh, um, set of physics you can access. Um, but it's sort of comparable in quality. So for example, you know, this is the only Landau level physics I'll talk about. If you measure the electronic compressibility. Um, of a burnout of regular bilayer graphene, you'll see a variety of incompressible states at partial filling of Landau levels, including even denominators and all kinds of um, uh, all kinds of fractional fillings. So you can basically realize all of fractional quantum Hall physics, um, uh, you know, very nice. And that's a very beautiful sort of research direction, but but not what I'm going to talk about today. Okay, so let me start by talking about sort of the origin of flat band physics in um, in twisted bilayer graphene and related. Uh, related, um, uh, related, comp, you know, sort of, uh, heterostructures. So, uh, in twisted bilayer graphene, um, you can see illustrated upper left. There's a, uh, uh, you know, when you rotationally misalign uh, two layers, um, you find that, uh, of course, there's some interference between those misaligned layers, and it generates a moiré pattern. Um, and that moiré pattern, you can think about as a uh, a super lattice potential, which um, uh, which gives you a, a super lattice wavelength, which is tunable with that angle. So, in particular, for angles of about a degree, it's going to be about ten nanometers, which means that full filling of a super lattice unit cell is just one electron per one of these unit cells is on the order of, uh, or rather, it's four electrons per unit cell because you have spin and valley degeneracy. But that's on the order of a few ten to the twelve. Um, uh, electrons per centimeter square. That's easily accessible uh, with uh, electrostatic gating uh, in these structures. Now, the key thing is that there's this sort of subtle interplay, uh, kind of an interference effect between um, the strength of interlayer tunneling and this rotational misalignment. 
in such a way that uh, you know, for large misalignment, you might have essentially two decoupled monolayers that because these K points are very well separated then in the two layers, if you rotate the two uh, Brillouin zones with respect to each other, there's, there's not strong coupling between the two layers. When they're rotated to, of course, you know, when you rotate them to zero, you form Bernal bilayer graphene and then they're very strongly coupled. The electronic structure is completely uh, reconfigured. It turns out that around one degree, um, there's a kind of interesting effect where uh, there's a band flattening and, and you, um, the, uh, you end up with a relatively isolated flat, meaning you know, few milli electron volt bandwidth uh, band uh, right around charge neutrality. Um, and uh, so of course, this is a perfect uh, situation to look for uh, to look for many body effects um, uh, because you have a high density of states and high density of states at the very least is going to give you paramagnetism more generally uh, is going to be where you can expect uh, the, the comparatively weak electron electron interactions after all the charge density here is quite low to nevertheless be the dominant uh, to nevertheless be the dominant um, uh, variable in determining uh, the electronic ground state. Okay, so um, uh, there's, you know, I think I, I won't like give an exhaustive overview of the history, but maybe the important experiments are, um, are some of them are listed here, right? There's, uh, uh, you know, there was the realization that you could indeed make an isolated flat band. So you can see as, as you approach uh, one degree here in experiments from, two, from Emmanuel to Tuke, you see insulating states at charge densities corresponding to four electrons or four holes per unit cell. And in that situation, that, that's basically saying that as you get close to this so-called magic angle, you now have an isolated band, which is separated by some gaps from higher dispersive bands. And then as you actually approach 1.1 exactly, which was where it uh, uh, where this flat, you know, this band starts to actually become flat, then um, you get uh, correlated insulators that happen not at four or minus four electrons per unit cell, but rather at two or minus two electrons per unit cell, okay? So that's suggestive of some kind of symmetry breaking. You've got to break some kind of symmetry to have an insulator where, you know, band theory would predict you're just at partial filling of, of a fourfold degenerate uh, band. And then superconductivity in proximity to some of these, um, to some of these insulating states. Okay, um, and then the final, uh, you know, final piece of the puzzle, which is what I'm going to talk mostly about today, was then the observation that in a certain uh, variety of these magic angle structures, you can also see ferromagnetism as reflected by hysteretic transport. In this case, with actually a rather large uh, Hall effect, uh, um, you know, a Hall angle of, of about, you know, maybe 45 degrees or a little bit, a little bit less. Um, so. Uh, so, so clearly, you know, flat band physics is starting to manifest. You're starting to get things that are clearly driven by electron-electron interactions. Certainly, uh, on the side of um, these correlated insulators and the ferromagnetism, superconductivity. I think it's still an open question. But regardless, high density of states is where you get, you know, interested, interesting effects. Whether they're all electronic in origin or also electron phonon in origin, um, uh, you know, nobody. Uh, Will, will dispute that high density of states is going, to, is going to help you out, right? So this, this is sort of work in magic angle project. So let me tell you about some sort of, you know, some, some of this physics in a little more depth. So let me, let me show you um, some of our data. So uh, what, what our approach was to try to, you know, study these samples and study a variety of these samples with, um, uh, with higher sample quality, fundamentally, you know, again, a bit of a one trick pony, but trying to, um, uh, trying to remove at the very least charge disorder, which we do by making sure we always use these graphite gates as sort of our, our basic hygiene protocol that removes these uh, charge fluctuations and lets us access states that are very narrowly defined in density, for example. So if you remove density fluctuations, then you can try to access states that are, that are more um, uh, sharply uh, density constrained, for example, at integer or fractional filling. So, um, so the sample I'm going to tell you about to begin with are uh, they're magic angle twisted bilayer graphene, so they're theta of you know 1.15 or so. Um, but the key point is that they're aligned to the you know crystal the crystalline axes of this twisted bilayer are aligned to the hexagonal boron nitride substrate. And we know from many studies on um, monolayer graphene, for example, that if you align graphene to hexagonal boron nitride, even though there's a lattice mismatch, uh, this generates a mass 
um, at the in these Dirac valleys. So rather than having massless Dirac fermions for monolayer graphing, you now have massive Dirac fermions. You get a relatively large uh, energy gap of let's say 30 uh, milli electron volts um, if, if for, for good alignment. And the same thing is expected to happen for twisted bilayer. So the band structure that you expect um, for uh, for twisted bilayer graphene aligned to hexagonal boron nitride is relatively simple. So here's the band structure for a moiré mini band um, near the K or K prime uh, valleys. And essentially you get some isolated flat, these bands are quite flat. I don't have a scale here, but these are on the scale of a few, maybe 10, 10, 10 milli electron volts or a few milli electron volts. And um, there is a valence band and a conduction band, which are separated by a gap at charge neutrality, which is coming from this hexagonal boron nitride alignment. And the key point is that these bands have a net orbital moment and they have a net churn number. Uh, in particular, they have a churn number of, of one or minus one per spin, uh, per spin projection um, and, uh, uh, and, and a net orbital moment. Um, and that net orbital moment and churn number are uh, equal and opposite in the uh, in the K and K prime valley. Okay, so this is what one of these samples looks like, and and most of the physics I'm going to tell you about is actually, you know, only happening in a very small corner of this sample. Um, something I'll get back to uh, at length later in the talk is the fact that um, these magic angle structures are not structural ground states. They're not even metastable states. So realizing uniform twist angle is extremely challenging. I mean, in some sense, it's impossible. Uh, but uh, you can realize it on sort of mesoscopic scales. So, um, so the main variable that ends up being important is, uh, is really disorder in this moiré super lattice. Even though the graphene layers are highly perfect, you know, their structural ground state is to be aligned with each other. They don't want to be at 1.1 degrees. They certainly don't care about being at 1.1 degrees versus 1.11 degrees. Um, energetically, that's just not a very big difference. So you're quenching in strain, which means that, you know, reproducibility is an issue in these systems. And even within a single device, you'll have many different behaviors along, uh, you know, as a function of position. And I'll get back to that later. Okay, but, you know, but the advantage is, you know, you make one sample and you can explore lots of physics because there's this kind of mesoscopic disorder. And, you know, if one part of your sample doesn't show anything interesting, maybe a different part of your sample will. And that was the case for this, uh, for this device I'll tell you about. So what I'm plotting here are um, the, Hall resistivity and the longitudinal resistivity measured at some small magnetic field of, of one or 200 millitesla. And um, what you can see is that the Hall resistivity in orange actually becomes very large at three electrons per unit cell. So I'm, gonna, I'm plotting this as a function of charge carrier density on the x-axis, but also as a function of filling of this super lattice unit cell on, on the upper axis. So right at three electrons per unit cell, um, one finds that there is a uh, very large Hall effect, which is just around uh, the quantized value of, of H over E squared, and a deep dip in the um, longitudinal resistivity of uh, you know, getting very close to zero. And if you measure this more carefully, in particular, you can sit at three electrons per unit cell and sweep the magnetic field and be very careful about, uh, about how you um, you know, that you measure sufficiently small currents and, and anti-symmetrize uh, your, your, to get these resistivity coefficients uh, accurately, you find that in fact, it's very close to quantize. It's within, you know, a fraction of a percent of uh, the H over E squared and, um, and the longitudinal resistance uh, vanishes uh, again to, you know, to, to within, let's say, a, a small, a fraction of a percent of, of H over E squared. Um, in addition, you can see that there are these big jumps. It's, of course, hysteretic. There are these Barkhausen-type jumps and coercive fields on the order of a few tens or 100 um, uh, millitesla. So you see a quantized anomalous Hall effect here um, uh, at this filling. Okay, so how can we understand this? Well, pretty straightforwardly, actually, from the band structure. So um, we know that, uh, you know, from band structure calculations that you have churn bands in your system. In the different and, and that you have equal and opposite churn numbers for these uh, in the different valleys. So um, it's relatively straightforward to imagine what's happening. You have, if you valley polarize, so if you polarize, let's say, at three electrons per unit cell, which is where we are, if you polarize into one of these uh, valley bands, then you'll have a net churn number. And it's, it's rather straightforward to see how that could happen. Now, the key question um, 
in all of these systems is, you know, why do that instead of something else? Why is this the ground state under this circumstance and so on? And for that, you know, I think a ex very extensive um, numerics at this point have been done on these types of systems. And the basic bottom line is that this is always uh, this is always in the spectrum somewhere. You know, these types of quantum anomalous Hall states are ubiquitous. And sometimes they can be the ground state. The, the hexagonal boron nitrate alignment uh, seems to be important because it, it uh, disfavors a variety of other competing states, which equally occupy the valleys. Um, but, uh, uh, but you know, numerics seem to more or less check out that in fact, you know, at let's say the hartree fock level, this is, um, uh, this is not terribly surprising. Um, uh, and it so happens that in, in these types of samples, it, 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 it happens. So, you know, what, what we think is happening is that you are uh, polarized, your state is, your system is spontaneously polarizing into uh, one of the valleys completely at, uh, at three electrons per unit cell that fills one super lattice band worth of holes, if you want, relative to full filling of these bands. And that gives you a net churn number and presumably a net orbital moment. Uh, and that's what, you know, that's what generates all of this physics. Okay, so um, before I sort of get to some of those microscopics and, and, and some, some variations on it, let me talk about a little bit the phenomenology. In particular, let me compare it to, uh, you know, sort of the, the usual ways people look at, um, at these types of systems. So measuring the electronic, uh, you know, the electronic transport coefficients as a function of temperature, you can extract an energy scale for, um, uh, for, for the energy gap. Uh, and it's relatively consistent between RxX and RxY. You, in low temperature limit, you find an um, activation gap on the order of 30 Kelvin. Um, if you look at an AROT plot to try and determine what the Curie temperature is, actually, it's remarkable. You find it to be considerably smaller than that low temperature electronic gap um, of something on the order of you know, 7 or 8 Kelvin is the Curie temperature, whereas the activated gap is, is something like 30 Kelvin. And this is not that surprising uh, in terms of uh, what you'd expect theoretically for a clean system, um, what we are told by our, our, our friends who do uh, numerics on these types of systems. Um, basically, you can, you know, the, you can think about this Curie temperature as, you know, the Coulomb scale here is on the order of 100 Kelvin, and there are lots of states that compete. So presumably your, well, I'll get back to this sort of at the end of the talk, but um, 10 Kelvin is kind of the scale at which all of these types of insulating states uh, start to appear, mostly because there's lots of competition, even though the Coulomb scale is relatively large and there's strong fluctuations. Um, but uh, the activated, you know, gap turns out to be, you know, 3 MeV in, in numerics also, and, and it's roughly the same scale, but it can actually be a bit larger. Um, but, you know, what's remarkable is, is comparing experimentally to uh, conventional, quote unquote, quantum anomalous Hall systems. So quantum anomalous Hall effects are relatively rare. They've only been observed in a couple of other uh, a couple of other experimental systems, originally by uh, trying to induce magnetism, you know, same intuition of you'd like to start with the rock points and gap them out and then make them magnetic. Uh, in twisted bilayer graphene, that sort of all happens at once intrinsically. But, you know, the way this was originally engineered was by chromium doping or some other uh, transition metal dope uh, bismuth antimony telluride thin films. Um, and in those systems, you find a Curie temperature that's actually quite large. It's really Curie temperature of these chromium dopants or, or iron dopants or you know various other things that people have tried vanadium dopants, um, but the uh, induced gap is very small. It's it's you know maybe a fact an order of magnitude or more smaller than what we see in twisted bilayer graphene. So the hierarchy is totally different, and you can basically understand this by the fact that those systems are quite disordered. That these chromium dopants are put in in very large quantities. They may or may not go on the bismuth sites. They may go into interstitials, but microscopically, those systems are very disordered. And that basically degrades the, uh, the electronic gap. Uh, presumably, you're seeing really there a mobility gap or something like that. Whereas in, in twisted bilayer graphene, even though the Curie temperature is you know, of order only 10 Kelvin, the, the activation gap can be quite large because not particularly degraded by, uh, by microscopic scale um, disorder. Um, Okay, and I'll, I'll you know so so one thing that I'll point out. Though, Andrea, is that, you know, can I yeah, just sure, ask, sure. ask a question? Um, yeah, yeah, is, is, there, yeah. is there any notion that there might be a universal ratio of TC to delta in some limits? In some so, limits, I'm sure, <laughs> but uh, but as far as I understand, it's actually sort of it, certainly in twisted bilayer graphene, it's very much details. Okay, uh, it's very much related to details and, and details of you know what are the 
you know, charged excitations for a given state. And it depends on, in a sense, a lot of parameters because there are lots of competing states. I mean, that's, you know, the, the, the basic issue, it's, you know, it's a bug and a feature, right? I think in the early days, it was a feature. Now I would strongly characterize it as a bug of, um, of these more systems. That there are lots of competing states. So, you know, if you cool down three samples, the likelihood of getting the same result three times is zero. Uh, you'll get something different. And there are some things that are pretty generic but nothing is quantitatively, quantitatively similar. And sometimes things are really different. I mean, you cool down two samples at the beginning and one of them superconducting, one of them was quantum anomalous Hall. Most samples, for example, at nu equals three that are not aligned to hexagonal board nitrogen just show a topologically trivial insulator, which probably breaks the super lattice symmetry. Maybe it's a stripe of some kind. You know, and that's all details. And you know, tuning those two things between each other has to do with now a, another angle, but also lots of parameters, including you know, la lots of lattice scale physics. That so, that so if possible. you make a new sample, you may not even get the same ground state. And if you do get the same ground state, you'll probably get a different TC and delta. Definitely, absolutely, that's exactly right. And in fact, this quantum anomalous hall, yeah. uh, we have not been able to reproduce in twisted bilayer graphene uh, since this since this work that I just showed you. Um, wow. Now I'll show you that we've been able to reproduce it in related systems by those intuitions. And actually just, just yesterday on archive, uh, there's a very beautiful work from Kin Fi Max group showing a uh, nice quantum anomalous hall in a moiré, uh, in, a, in a transition metal calcogenide uh, moiré system. And they seem to, that seems to be very reliable there and that they've made three or four samples. They all show the same thing. Very much not the case in twisted bilayer for reasons that I think we understand and I'll talk about microscopically. I mean, for one thing, you need to control not just one angle, but two, which is the angle to the boron nitride as well. That's very hard to do. And the second is that in these magic angle graphene systems, the susceptibility to twist angle disorder is just very high. It's very hard to make them uniform at all. So in fact, the fact that we saw quantum anomalous Hall effect in this, uh, in the device that I just showed you, now that we, I'll show you sort of extensive imaging studies of that same device and it's a miracle that it worked i mean it's just it, <laughs> okay, it did you. not have yeah 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 so um, so yes what you said is exactly right uh for these types of systems reproducibility is a major issue certainly quantitative reproducibility is an issue as an example right people ask oh why don't you know you want to figure out if it's phonons or not for the superconductivity do the isotope effect right i mean the isotope effect is square root of m2 over m1 so that comes out to a 1% effect for, you know, carbon 13 graphene. And uh, that's, uh, that's many orders, you know, if you make five samples, one of them will superconduct and four of them won't at all. So, you know, you're certainly not going to be looking for 1% differences between samples uh, yeah. anytime. Uh, in, in. But, you know, I think, again, for this first part of, you know, this first talk, I, I really want to give a tour of just the spectacular phenomenology. And then the second talk, I'm going to try to try to paint a picture of a path forward where we maybe don't have to worry about this type of disorder. Um, but, you know, for now, let's just enjoy, uh, kind of enjoy the random tourism uh, that we're doing and the chance encounters we might have. So, um, you know, for example, in these quantum anomalous hall systems, they do, they respond to external stimuli in rather spectacular ways. So, for example, you can flip the magnetization with a tiny current. And you know, this is of course annoying when you don't know it, but once you figure it out, it, 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 it's, it's rather beautiful. So you can, um, you know, if you tune yourself kind of not too far from the Curie temperature, you have a huge Hall effect, right? It's kind of a significant fraction still of the quantized value. And you've now gotten to a temperature regime where only one domain is still hysteretic. And now you can just apply a small DC bias current and flip your the magnetization of your whole sample up and down. Uh, uh, actually very reliably. So for example, you know, you can um, make this into a current switchable bit where you put little current pulses of a few nanoamps and reverse the magnetization um, up and down and up and down and up and down, you know, as many times as you like. So um, uh, we don't exactly understand this actually, you know, the mechanism for this current switching, there's sort of a variety of things that have come up in the literature, but um, one idea is just that, you know, in a churn insulator like this, if, as soon as you have a device geometry that's not symmetric, actually passing some current along a chiral edge state, uh, uh, that current will effectively enter your free energy, if you want to think about it uh, uh, that way, and uh, it, it, with with odd uh, you know with odd parity, so that a current flowing along, let's say, the right edge for a churn one 
will lower the total energy relative to current flowing along the left edge for turn minus one. And so you can, this, this can give you a mechanism. There are a number of other mechanisms also that have been proposed having to do with uh, pushing around domains. Uh, although, as I'll show you, we think the domains are extremely strongly pinned. So there's not really any much dynamics except for this total reversal. Um, so, you know, as I, you know, as in response to Pierce's question, I, I, I mentioned that, you know, the reproducibility is very hard. We were not able to reproduce the system. So um, this, this quantum anomalous Hall effect. So, so that led us to actually try to think about what was, you know, what was the relevant feature and how can we reproduce the same physics in a different, um, with, with more reliability. So the key, the key issue for us is that if, you know, it's hard to make twisted bilayer graphene that is reliably at a given angle. And now if you also want those, you know, that 20% yield of having actually a clean magic angle to also be aligned to boron nitride, that's even harder because it's hard to tell what the relative, uh, at, you know, the crystallographic axis alignment is between disparate materials. And so if the key thing is to break super lattice symmetry, then there's a, there's a more straightforward way to do it, which is that uh, instead of making magic angle monolayer monolayer, you could do magic angle between a monolayer and a Bernal bilayer. And the Bernal bilayer, of course, has intrinsically broken super lattice symmetry because one of those uh, sub lattices sits on top of another carbon atom and the other one doesn't. So you'd realize a system with the same symmetries uh, and you know a, a similarly flat band um, without uh, having to align crystallographic axes between different uh, materials. And so this is what data looks like here now because you know Bernal bilayer graphene of course is uh, uh, strongly susceptible to an out of plane electric field that the electronic structure changes a lot. So is this now trilayer system. So you can look at, so as a function of D, which is the displacement field, and N, you get a phase diagram where, uh, uh, where things are tuned by this displacement field. And, and, the, and the region that I want to point out is uh, in this particular region of the displacement field. It's not terribly important why it happens here relative than somewhere else. That's where you generate a flat band. And um, we indeed see, again, correlated insulators. So something at nu equals 1 and nu equals 2 and nu equals 3 um, and some others, which I'll show you later. Uh, and um, uh, so that seems to sort of work in the sense that you've indeed made a flat band and that flat band has uh, um, uh, shows correlated insulators at those uh, at, at those at, at intermediate fillings. But you know the important thing is that actually not only does it show correlated insulators, but those correlated insulators are also apparently incipient quantum anomalous Hall effects. So you can see measurements of RxY and RxX, and you know they're not beautifully quantized, but at nu equals one and nu equals three, you get something very close to half uh, H over E squared for RxY and a very small um, uh, RxX. And uh, this basically makes sense if these are quantum anomalous Hall effects with churn number two. Uh, and that actually is, makes sense when you add that extra layer to the Bernal and you work through the band structure, you find that in fact the valley and spin projected bands now have typically have churn numbers that can be two and in this relevant regime uh, there too. That's consistent with band structure effects and also harsh thought calculations and it makes sense. Okay, so so it's and this is now much more reproducible. We've done this a few times, and it sort of looks the same every time, down to most of the most of the details. It still suffers from twist angle disorder, as I'll describe later. But but basically, you know, indeed, one does see these uh, relatively reproducibly. But there's actually something more interesting that occurs here, uh, which is which is rather new. So um, at nu equals one, so what I'm plotting on the bottom here is a magnetic field and density dependence of this Hall plateau. And you can see that the Hall plateau uh, moves in density as a function of magnetic field. And that's exactly what you'd expect for uh, a quantum Hall state or a quantum anomalous Hall state. It's consistent with the strata formula, which basically relates the density at which uh, an incompressible state of finite churn number uh, is observed as a function of magnetic field. And that basically comes from, uh, uh, you know, from the interplay between Barry curvature and magnetic flux. Um, the, uh, but at nu equals three, which is a more nicely and more robustly quantized uh, quantum anomalous Hall state, actually this plot looks terrible. Uh, there's all kinds of switchy, strange, uh, strange behavior. And you know, when I first saw this, I thought there's just something wrong with the device. You're not measuring it right. I didn't know something you know, was, uh, um, was maybe blind, but uh, but it turns out that um, that actually that's a very much a real effect, and it comes from 
Uh, and you, you, know, you can see it more clearly on this kind of weird 3D plot where on this axis, I'm showing the magnetic field. And so here you're seeing a, a typical magnetic hysteresis in blue and green. And so you know, as you sweep the magnetic field at some given gate voltage, you flip, uh, you, know, you flip the magnetization when you're a positive or negative field. But what's remarkable is that actually you can sit at a finite magnetic field, let's say you know, 50 millitesla, and sweep just your gate voltage, and you can also flip uh, the magnetic, uh, uh, fl flip the magnetic uh, state and flip the sign of the Hall resistivity between positive and negative, uh, just as a function of gate voltage at fixed magnetic field. Okay, and that's that's an unusual effect. There there are a number of situations, although not many, where you can using a gate turn on and off a magnetic moment. But as far as I know, there's no other situation where you apparently can reverse a magnetic moment in fixed magnetic field uh, using only uh, an electric uh, an electronic gate voltage. So so what's going on here, right? So um. So let's go back to this idea of you know, just this formula for orbital magnetization, right? So we have, um, you know, omega is Berry curvature, m is this orbital magnetization. And generically, both of these are chemical potential dependent. Uh, in the bulk, they're arbitrary functions of, you know, they're whatever, they're whatever comes out of your band structure. They can certainly be positive or negative. Now, in most ferromagnets, it's a small effect compared to the spin moments, which of course are going to just align with the magnetic field based on whatever their G factors, which is not going to be strongly density dependent. But in a purely orbital magnet, um, this is all there is. And as a result, it's, uh, it's possible to actually change the sign of M as a function of mu. Uh, and that's what we think is going on here. So in fact, there's a particularly simple um, situation where this may occur, which is you can ask what happens in a gap. And in a gap, this term is vanishes. Only this term is chemical potential dependent. And so you can see that m of mu within a gap is just linearly increasing with the chemical potential within that gap. And its coefficient is just given by the churn number and, and some units. Okay, So the change in magnetization across a gap of a certain size is going to be c times the size of that gap divided by phi naught. And what we think is happening in this experiment is that uh, if that change in magnetization that you get just from the chiral edge states, it's effectively the magnetic moment of the chiral edge state, is larger than the so and then the magnetization of the bulk. And if that magnetization of the bulk is of opposite sign, you can actually reverse the sign of the magnetization just because you've now you've populated a chiral edge state in your quantum anomalous Hall state. Which means that if you're in a finite magnetic field, then you've gone from being in the ground state, let's say your orbital moments were aligned uh, to the magnetic field, but now you change the chemical potential and now they're misaligned, they're in the wrong direction. And so then if you have some irreversible dynamics and hysteresis, then it'll hysteretically switch even as a function of, 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 um, of chemical potential at fixed field because uh, you've simply um, switched the sign of the magnetization and now you're, now you're stuck in the wrong state and now you have to uh, irreversibly uh, relax. So, um, so this, you know, right around the time we were taking this data, we saw this preprint from uh, Alan McDonald's group, which predicted exactly this effect, albeit for twisted bilayer graphene. Um, and they helped us to do these calculations for um, for twisted monobi and found that, in fact, you know, the effect is 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 indeed likely to be robust in this effect. You're helped a bit by the fact that the churn number is larger. So this effect here is going to be larger the larger the churn number is. But the fundamental point is that you know, in a typical churn insulator, and so much as such a thing exists, let's say in a, in a magnetic uh, redoped topological insulator, this can never be observed because the spin magnetization is enormous, right? And these orbital effects are tiny in comparison. But here again, it's, it's, all that there, it's all that there is. So you can just play with it by populating different band wave functions or changing, um, you know, changing your structure a little bit. And all of, this, all of this is relatively experimentally tunable. So again, we can play this game that, that we got into playing of, of switching our you know, making our world's most expensive uh, gate tunable uh, mag single magnetic bit. And now you can see that you can flip the Hall resistivity uh, between positive and negative up and down very reproducibly as a function of magnetic field ramps, but also as a function of these uh, density uh, or really gate voltage uh, ramps by just a few millivolts. You can flip, uh, you can flip your magnetic bit up and down. Okay, so, um, so let me talk about one more thing in this system before I move on to microscopics, which is actually that uh, uh, more recently, we've uh, been looking at the system more closely and we've actually started to see um, 
uh, correlated insulators, not just an integer filling of the super lattice unit cells, so at one, two, three, and four, but also start to see states at fractional filling. So this is now, let's say, three halves or seven halves of an electron per unit cell. Okay, and if we look at these uh, these states closely, and uh, yeah, I'm sorry, this is slightly out of date data. This this data has improved a little bit since then. You can see that at nu equals three, you have a churn number of two, but at nu equals seven halves, you actually have a churn number of one, and then finally, of course, at full filling, you have a churn number of zero. Which means that by filling essentially half an electron per unit cell, you've changed the churn number, but you still have a gap state which is still spontaneously breaking time reversal symmetry, it's not terribly close to quantized, maybe 50 or 60% of the value, but it follows this strata slope relatively well. So what we think that is, is a, um, uh, uh, a, a kind of a charge density wave, which you know, breaks the super lattice symmetry, presumably it's making stripes, but partitions the very curvature between occupied and unoccupied states in such a way that you have, uh, uh, sorry, there's a typo here. Uh, this should be churn number one um, uh, that uh, keeps the um, uh, maintains a churn number that's intermediate between the, the adjacent integer type states. We've in, in, we've seen this type of state before at high magnetic fields, where it happens when you partially fill a very flat high churn number Hofstadter butterfly band. Um, but uh, this is sort of the first realization, you know, at zero magnetic field. Uh, where it's really just coming from uh, magnetism in these super lattice bands, and, and it doesn't involve a strong interplay with the, um, with the magnetic flux. Um, what's exciting to us about this, and, and we, we, uh, we saw um, some theoretical evidence that we're in the right limit uh, in this paper, which you can find on archive, is that uh, in Hofstadter bands, which we studied you know, a fair amount a couple of years ago, um, you know, once you start seeing these symmetry broken churn insulators, that's really telling you that your, your, your churn bands are flat enough that you can, um, you know, your, your correlations are going to make states out of any combination of them. And so right around, you know, in the same types of samples where one sees these symmetry broken churn insulators, one also then starts to see fractional churn insulators where you not only have fractional filling of the super lattice uh, band, but you also have fractional Hall effects and presumably fractional uh, charge of statistics. And um, so I think the exciting direction for us and something that we're we're poking around and trying to find is, you know, can you realize a fact, you know, now that we've seen a symmetry broken churn insulator, you know, or we've also called topological charge density wave at zero magnetic field, can you do the same for essentially, can you make a fractional quantum Hall effect at zero magnetic field? Um, and besides the sort of convenience of doing that, and it's maybe conceptual novelty in a, um, in a system, uh, uh, which is where it's just being generated from lattice bands and ferromagnetism, I think there's an interesting idea there, which is that, you know, in the past, when we want to study fractional quantum Hall effects, which we certainly do, um, they, their energy scales are just intrinsically small. It's E squared over magnetic length times usually some small number, a tenth or a hundredth or something like that. Um, it'd be nice to change, you know, you can, there's only so much you can do in a Landau level, but in a, um, in a churn band, you know, in principle, you could try to do it instead of doing it for a 10 nanometer super lattice, maybe you can do it for a five nanometer super lattice, and, and that helps a lot. Maybe you can do it for a three nanometer super lattice. Maybe there's a way to, uh, to make that Coulomb energy simply larger. There are trade-offs with the density, but there's certainly an optimum you could imagine where uh, you want to be at, let's say, one-third filling of a churn band, and that's, you'd like to reach that with electrostatic gates. Um, and uh, so what super lattice would you like? How big a gap can you make for a uh, fractional quantum Hall state uh, at zero or close to zero magnetic field? And so I think that's kind of a direction that we're going uh, with, this, um, uh, with this physics in general. And so, uh, so, so that's, uh, that's something that we'd like to keep thinking about and, and keep working on. Okay, Piers, how much longer should I keep going? Well, I think it makes sense to you know, wrap it up in about five minutes. Or, Fine, or I'm gonna show it. Whenever I'm going to flash. I'm going to flash a couple of slides about the microscopics here, and then I'll probably stop okay. there, and I won't talk about the last thing I want to talk about, which is probably okay. I mean, um, you can of course continue in your talk tomorrow, and you can stop at the point that's most convenient for. That's you. fine. All right, I'll just now. talk. Yeah, yeah I'll I'll, yeah. I'll show a couple of slides. So I want to you know just close and maybe as a preamble to the talk tomorrow, um, with with looking at you know looking a little bit under the hood of these samples and you know 
in a sense, why I hate working on this. And why, you know, uh, I've shown you why I love working on this. Now let me show you why I hate working on this. So the um, the uh, the tech. I'm going to switch techniques. I've mostly shown you transport data so far, but I'm going to switch techniques to showing you scanning magnetometry data. So um, the idea here is to just directly image these magnetic states and try to understand their domain dynamics, for example, microscopically. And so I'm going to tell you, I'm going to show you images that are taken using scanning squid on tip microscopy. Um, this is a, a sensitive and, and, and kind of 100 nanometer scale resolution um, magnetic imaging technique that gives you the sensitivity that you need to be able to see these relatively small moments, right? I mean, if you think about how big these moments really are, uh, they're not big and, um, you know, in, in two dimensions, uh, magnetization density is, is, has units of current. So there's sort of few tens of nanoamp uh, type current, which translates for our, the relevant scale into few, into a hundred nano Tesla type uh, magnetic fields, which is hard to do. So, um, so, you know, what I'm showing you here are images of the same quantized anomalous Hall effect device but now measured magnetically. And what, what you're looking at is actually a derivative of the magnetic field just above the sample along a direction that sort of points up and to the right in these images. And to extract the magnetization density, what we do is we compare images taken at opposite preparations, but the same magnetic field in, in these uh, you know, opposite preparations of the sample in terms of magnetic histories. And then we can compare them and look at differences, which give us the just the purely, you know, this is essentially a measurement of the saturation magnetization, uh, or rather the magnetic field arising from the saturation magnetization of, of this of this ferromagnet. You can see that it's actually quite highly disordered, and uh, you can back that, you know, you can use that data to measure that magnetization density. One thing that you can do is you can find that, in fact, it's, it's quite large compared to what you'd expect just for spins. You know, these are very low density systems, but that orbital moment can, of course, be larger than a Bohr magneton. We find that it's something on the order of four Bohr magnetons per unit cell, and recall this is effectively the biggest you could get from spin is really one, because you have one whole band relative to a non-magnetic state that's that's uh, that's occupied. Um, but uh, perhaps, you know, the thing that I, let me, um, yeah, perhaps the thing that, that I'll focus on is that, you know, we can look at these dynamics of these, uh, of these domains. So these Barkhausen jumps, and we can find that they are uh, indeed, you know, correlated, uh, that transport jumps are correlated with these sort of micron scale domain reversal. So this is a domain that, these are the domains that are characterizing, you know, these two, uh, these two steps. And, um, you know, the question is, you know, where does this, where does this pinning come from? You know, over many cool downs of this sample, you find the pinning is always in the same place. It's clearly coming from something structural. In uh, chromium dope bismuth antimony telluride, you know, you don't see these large domains. They are, seem to be completely coming from uh, microscopic um, uh, chromium dopant clustering. But uh, so here, what, what's, there's obviously nothing analogous to what's going on. So actually, there's another thing that you can do with this technique, which was you know, first shown by uh, Ellie Zeldov's group, who you know, the inventors of nanosquid. Um, and uh, where you, know, you can map out the twist angle. You can do this by using the density at which certain Landau level features associated with higher subbands occur. And so this is a map in our device of this uh, of the twist angle, you can see that it varies appreciably by about 0 0.05 over the range uh, that, that we're probing. Um, there are patches of quasi-uniformity, but there are very strong gradients at certain grain boundaries. And so you can, you know, you can, you can visualize this by instead of plotting theta, you can plot the magnitude of that theta gradient. And you can, this shows you exactly where these strong twist angle uh, gradients are. And indeed, you can just correlate directly a strong twist angle gradient here, for example, with where these domain walls are, uh, are pinned. And so it's very clear from this that, uh, uh, that, um, that this structural disorder in the form of you know, strain between the layers, which changes the moiré unit cell size, is what's responsible for pinning, uh, uh, for pinning these magnetic domains in these quantum anomalous halls. So let me just close by sort of showing, you know, why I said this was a miracle, right? I mean, if we just think of that, that, we, that, that the transport is quantized at all, actually, I still don't fully believe, you know, how, how it can be. But, um, 
the uh, basic idea here is let's look at this twist angle map and ask ourselves, you know, within the transport plateau, here's where transport is quantized. Um, where do we actually expect there to be intrinsic gap microscopically? Let's say that everything is indeed dominated by twist angle disorder. Um, you know, what is, where is their actual quantum anomalous hull? And um, you can estimate this from the size of the energy gap and from this measured twist angle map. And um, if you look at a video, what you can do is you can sweep the density. And when you're in the quantized hall plateau, basically this is where we think it's actually incompressible based on this twist angle map. In other words, based on the twist angle, where are you actually at nu equals three? And it's a very small region. It's essentially these little ribbons of uh, of uh, of yellow are where uh, are where this occurs, right? So um, so very surprising that uh, that actually there's quantized transport. Um, it's a very small region, but also interesting because it means that given that there's quantized transport, the edge states must be very strongly localized to the edges of this tiny ribbon, which is basically invisible here because it's a very strong twist angle gradient. So it means that the ribbon is really pinned right on that gradient. Um, and uh, you know something on the order perhaps of 10 nanometers or a unit cell length, which is you know just like in the Haldane model, you know this is a lattice or super lattice scale uh, quantum anomalous Hall effect. And so rather than some broad, you know many magnetic length type edge state as you get in quantum Hall, um, you really get something that's just uh, that's just that's very microscopically localized. Okay, let me finish here and uh, um, not talk about the last thing and uh, just maybe leave some time for discussion. Let me thank in particular. Fantastic. Um, yeah, uh, Charlie, Marak, and Gregory, uh, who um, were responsible for most of this, uh, most of what I showed you. Okay, well, let, let's thank Andrea for a fantastic talk. First of all. Really great. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's such a problem with a hybrid. Yeah. 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 I believe, you're for different I believe you're clapping. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, time for questions. There's a lot of material there. So, um, uh, do you have any questions? I haven't been looking in the chat recently. No, it's pretty uh, empty. Questions from the audience. Oh. Uh, whilst people are thinking, let me ask you something which, which probably sounds a bit silly, but do the spins respond to the, um, to, to, I mean, you've got, you've got diamagnetic currents, right, with, with formed in these churn states, so the break time reverse symmetry, do the spins actually pick that up, the spins align a little bit? Was it too small a field to align the I spin? think it's too small a field, I mean, it's, you know, if you think about electron G factors that, you know, Sort of micro Tesla. It just too small for temperature. Yeah. Yeah, uh, too small compared to temperature by uh, many by orders of magnitude. I mean, I think there's an interesting question about whether the spins order at all, or if they do it. You know, how big is spin orbit? You know, I say it's zero. It's presumably not zero. Um, it's thought to be very small. Mm -hmm. It's unclear whether it's really ever been measured. Um, as I understand it, you know, you're ordering temp. You know, if your Coulomb scale is 100 Kelvin. That that is sort of sets the scale of the ordering, but then there's some log, and I don't know what spin orbit is, but it might maybe they ordered a Kelvin, maybe they order at 100 millikelvin, maybe lower, maybe higher. Uh, you know, we haven't seen anything that we can interpret as evidence for that ordering, so I don't know. And uh, and a separate question is uh, you haven't talked about superconductivity, um, but do you do, do you have a uh, any signs of magnetism coexisting with your superconductivity? Uh, depends what you mean by magnetism. Or well, broken um, time reversal symmetry, I guess I'd be happy with it. Sure, yeah. So, I mean, I'll show, this is what I'll talk about. Um, I'll talk more about this tomorrow in ABC trilayer. But for example, in ABC trilayer, there's a superconductor that happens in a fully spin polarized half metal. So uh -huh. that's definitely, uh, that's definitely something uh, that I would call that coexistence with magnetism. Um, in twisted bilayer, superconductivity happens in some kind, you know, it looks sort of like a half metal, but it's not obviously spin polarized. It's probably something more complicated. You know, there, there's, a, there's a loss degeneracy of the Fermi surface where the main superconductivity occurs. That's presumably also similar. I think they're all kind of related. So yeah, I think, uh, 
you know, my basic, my basic take is that if you want my basic take on the superconductivity, I'll talk more about it tomorrow, is that, um, you know, there are many ways you can break symmetries. And in particular in graphing, you really have to think about the valleys and what symmetries are left. You may lift a symmetry. For example, if you spin polarize graphene, you still have valley symmetry. So you still have a kind of spinless time reversal. And there's still ways to, lots of ways to make superconductors out of that. In twisted bilayer graphene, it's more subtle because there's the C2T symmetry. So there are lots of ways to break symmetries, but preserve C2T. And if you preserve C2T, there's again, very natural ways to make pairs uh, that are nevertheless you know, protected by Anderson's theorem, even though you have in a sense, some kind of ferromagnet. So I think that's very important in all of this, in all the discussions of superconductivity and, you know, and widely discussed. Um, but yeah, I think that superconductivity coexists with magnetism all the time in some sense. Um, and it, you know, it is the generalized sense of magnetism. And, and in some cases, some that I'll show you tomorrow, it's very explicitly just spin ferromagnet um, and it's a superconducting spin ferromagnet. But in graphene, you've got to think about the valleys because that may make it a bit less exotic than you might naively think about in some other systems where you, if you had a spin polarized superconductor, you'd be, you'd be totally sure it must be exotic. Here, I think there's quite a bit of ways to make something, I mean, still exotic, but maybe not quite so exotic as, as it okay. would be in a different system. Yeah. But yeah, let me uh, invite Derek Lee to ask his question. Oh, hello. Um, where am I? I'm here. Yeah, no, I'm here. nobody else. I see one from Gunnar also. Yeah. Am, I, am I on? Yes, yeah, 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 I hear you. We can hear oh, you. Hello. Um, what was I going to ask? Oh, yes. Um, so thank you for a very interesting talk. I was just wondering, um, in, in your systems, do people see scumions when you go away from new cause one or whatever the filling is? Good question. Yeah, this is a, I mean, there's a hot, this is a hot topic right now, theoretically, certainly, because there's this idea that, um, you know, the, the, you know, in, in quantum hall, you know, you go to new equals one. I mean, certainly in quantum hall, we see skirmions and skirmion solids yeah. and all kinds of things like that, right? I think a very exciting idea, not sure whether it's experimentally correct yet, but like an exciting theoretical idea is that in these systems like twisted bilayer graphene, where you have opposite churn numbers in these opposite valleys, you can have skirmions that are actually charged 2E and can condense or oh. rather skirmion anti skirmions and anti skirmion pairs instead of having yeah. a charge zero, they have charge two E and condensation of those might be responsible for the superconductivity. Um, I think that's well, a beautiful yeah. idea. I'm not sure it's, I, yeah, I think I would say the jury's still <laughs> out. That would be a very cool way to have a superconductor. Some things check out, some things don't. So, yeah, you know, uh, that's, a, that's, that's an open question. But, but, but yes, yeah, uh, could be really important. Be, but skirmons usually have a very big electrical, no, no, a big, very big spin, so. Yeah, so the intro, I mean, I think the, the, that idea, I mean, I should, I'll summarize it, but you really should look at the, the theory paper right, okay. from Mike Zalatel and Ashwin Vishwanath and, and collaborators. Um, you know, is that, is that in this particular case, right, because of, it, it sort of relies on an assumption about a certain type of ordering that might happen in twisted bilayer graphene, uh -huh. whereby a skirmion, anti skirmion pair would very elegantly cancel out a large part of the Coulomb energy, and that's what would lead to their binding, and then you know, effectively being able to condense. Um, so anyway, I mean, you should look at the paper. Okay, course, yeah. You know, no, I, I'm summarizing it based on like minimal <laughs> knowledge, but I think it, it's, it's a very beautiful idea. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think an open question for me, given especially the results I'll tell you about tomorrow on ABC, where, you know, a lot of things are the same, but there's no more A, you're in a weak coupling rather than strong coupling type of limit, and you still see superconductivity and it looks kind of similar, um, is whether, you know, if, superconductivity is actually something exotic. I'd sort of like, you know, for, for aesthetic reasons, for there to be a link between, you know, I, I, my baseline assumption is that superconductivity and few layer graphites, whether they have a moiré or not, probably is coming from the same place. So then the question uh -huh. is, is this sort of a strong coupling, weak coupling limit? For example, is that skirmion idea kind of a strong coupling limit of some fluctuation based, you know, weak coupling type of uh, type of ideas, and I, I don't know. I just think it's an interesting thing to think about. Um, right. Thanks. Sorry. Very good. Uh, Gunnar, you had a question. Uh, yes, yeah, a question about the um, fractional quantum Hall states or fractional Shannon slaters. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, you said that you're more excited about the uh, 
um, fractional churn insulators at zero magnetic field, and I, I can certainly compare. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, feel feel the same. I think. But um, so one one question you might ask then is, um, I mean, what are the most likely fillings? Right. I mean, are you going to see it in sort of close to zero filling, or are you going to see it close to some other integer filling? Right. Because any I guess any holes that you have in these churn bands could also form a quantum Hall state, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, have you explored that uh, widely uh, in terms of uh, both filling and and then my other point is, you know, maybe about um, actually turning the field on. I mean, since you have a fairly long length scale here with the Mori unit cells already, I mean, you can actually get into a regime of very high flux density per Mori unit cell easily, right? So it's not so prohibitive to actually use the magnetic field. So I mean, no, not at all. And you know, yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't discuss that, but we've we've done some of that, and some other groups have certainly done some of that. Um, and yeah, in fact, you know, there's a there's an interesting. Um, uh, sorry for getting a little into the weeds, but I think there's an elegant like fact, which is that you know, in typical graphene. We have a weak we have a weak super lattice of the same type of scale, and you can go to high magnetic fields and get into this regime where the band structure is that of a Hofstadter butterfly. Mm -hmm. But it's a limit where you really should start from Landau levels, and then you kind of consider the weak perturbation of the super lattice. Whereas in twisted bilayer, it's closer to the Hofstadter Hofstadter butterfly, where you start from like tightly bound electrons, and then. Mm -hmm turn on a magnetic field. And so, you, you know, your energy scales for everything are still the lattice energy scales. The magnetic field is kind of a weak perturbation on top of those. And so that, yeah, we did see some of these symmetry broken churn insulators with a magnetic field and twisted bilayer, you know, at finite flux, because, you know, you just quickly make Hofstadter bands, you're quickly in the high flux limit. We didn't see any uh, fractional churn insulators, sadly, yet. So that's, I think that's, you know, what we're trying to think of now is just like, what is the right knob to turn, right? Like, what is the right, like, yeah. twist on this? I think you want, um, you'd like churn one or minus one bands rather right. than higher well, are, number bands. They're also, of course, in, in a way, the most boring ones because they're the ones that we have in lambda levels, right? So if you they are, higher but, churn bands, you know, I'm a big fan of. Higher, higher churn bands are great, but they, they, they suddenly have, a, you know, your variational space of what you can do is bigger. And it almost always wants to do something besides make fractional statistics. That seems yeah, to be right, like that, the base. So like, yeah. it depends what you want, right? I mean, we saw fractional churn insulators and higher churn Hofstadter bands, you know, at very high magnetic fields in the past, but they're weaker in the same way that I think if you have spin degeneracy mm -hmm. and lambda right. levels, more ways weaker, to make yeah. low leveling charge excitation. So, you know, I think for starters, we'd like a system that has, you know, very flat churn one bands to start with and see if at zero magnetic fields, you know, they avoid doing the things that we don't want, breaking various other symmetries and just make something topologically yeah. ordered. It but, sounds like your valleys are actually churn two bands, right? And, and... Yeah, a lot of these are churn two. Yeah, once you start putting more layers, generically, you get higher churn numbers because you've got more Dirac points you're sort of starting with. And, you know, you need to get lucky to gap them all out in such a way that you just get churn one. It's, 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 it's generic to get kind of churn numbers roughly equal to the number of layers that you have. And I mean, it's not perfect, but that's sort of, Roughly speaking, the more layers, the worse it is from that point of view, or better, depending on your, your point. Right. So yeah, basically you're asking about how can you get valley kind of symmetry breaking and then have fractional filling in in, in the channel. That's right. Yeah, those. and like you know, and avoid it doing some other thing. And also, by the way, the system should be clean and and, and you know, yes, right. It's, yeah. it's a lot of requirements. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that's, that's what, you know, we got to keep keep ourselves busy somehow, right? <laughs> okay. Thanks. Pretty impressive. Okay, uh, any other questions? Uh, if, if not, uh, Andrea will be coming back tomorrow um, and uh, we're looking forward to the second part of his talk. Um, so if I've not missed anyone, let's thank him. Thank you, Andrea. And uh, thanks see you tomorrow. We'll see you tomorrow. It, uh, what, you what time is it tomorrow? Uh, Good question. <laughs> uh, I, think, uh, I think it is Friday, actually. No, um, let's double oh, check. You're right, it's Friday. Even better. Sorry. Okay, let's and, yeah. start with the day. So the, yeah. the other thing I was going to point out, uh, there are actually two uh, related contributed talks. I mean, there are many on uh, tw twisted bilayer graphene, but um, two of them actually specifically on this new equals three uh, quantum Hall states and the physics of that. So. Uh, you might want to check through the contributor okay, talks. Yeah, I will, I will do yeah so it's it's four o'clock our time. Count back eight hours for your time. So I guess it's eight o'clock in the morning yeah, for you. Eight a.m. on Friday. Okay, and yep. everybody will either be.
ecstatic or depressed, I suppose, by then. So good luck. Uh, <laughs> see, you, see you in the finals, I say. It's coming finals. home. <laughs> they, they were, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I hope you're satisfied okay. with, the, with the final. Yeah, bye. <laughs> That's as far okay. as you get. <laughs> bye, see bye. ya. Bye-bye. Bye. See you. Stop the recording.